Hi all, Retro Tech Chris here again. So as we continue to celebrate December, I thought I would show you my PS2 Model 70 386. And I also wanted to upgrade it and provide sound capabilities, so we'll do that today as well. First, I'm going to give you an overview of the system, then we'll tear it down, we'll look at the components, we'll look at some of the configuration unique to a PS2, we'll look at the network configuration, then we'll add sound, and from there we'll wrap it up. So without further ado, let's go! So a little overview of this PS2 Model 70. I actually saw it for sale at VCF East this year, and I really wanted it because I wanted the keyboard. And for the price of $80, I got both. Here you see the front of the PS2 Model 70 386. You can see the floppy drive, the power switch, and that nice little 486 Now sticker indicating this system has a processor upgrade, which we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. I always love the IBM case badge, and this system proudly proclaims to be a personal system to Model 70 386. Here we see the back of the system. First we have an MCCF adapter, a memory adapter, a network card, then we have our VGA video, our serial, parallel, and our PS2 ports. We also have our power in, and you can also see that we're missing a couple of screws. I guess I could try and find some to replace it. Now about that video connection, it's a little bit special. It does have a blank pin that you see there on the connection itself, and I was tempted to drill it out. However, I decided to just modify cable instead, and here you can see I broke off a pin. Let's go ahead and tear this system down. First, we'll power it off. Looking at the back, all we have to do is undo these two thumb screws you see here, and the system case will slide right off. So we'll get those undone, sped up just a little bit. We'll also undo the thumb screws for the cards in the back, since we'll be pulling them out as well. And with that, we can simply pull the case off, piece of cake, and before long it's loose and we're ready to go. Let's have a quick look at installed components before I start pulling them out. First we have a floppy drive and an ESDI hard drive, and a battery to back system settings. Then we have our MCCF card, a memory card, and a network card. Let's get to pulling things out, and I promise we will look at things in greater detail a little bit later. So all of the expansion cards are out. We can pull the floppy drive out. You can see it here. Very nice. And we'll pull that ESDI hard drive out. These can be a bit of a pain, but fortunately it wasn't too bad. We'll get that out of the system. We'll pull out this riser card, and the next thing we can do is take this tool that's included with the system and pop up these little rivets, or whatever they are, plastic rivets, and we can pull off this connection here. So we're pulling it off very carefully. You're going to notice I fold it over to the side, and I do not disconnect the battery connector you see here, and there's a reason for that. With all of the components taken out, we can see the upgraded CPU here, which is a 486DX33. We also have two 2 megabyte SIMs installed. And you can see the three microchannel slots over here on the left as well. Let's have a closer look at the components. First, we have this 60 megabyte ESDI drive that you see here, and yes, it does work. Here we have our MCIDE CF card, and I have two CF cards installed. We could also add an external hard drive via the Molex and connector you see on the far left. Next, we have the floppy drive again. Aren't these lovely and nice and proprietary, like pretty much everything else that you see on this system? Here we have our Kingston upgrade card, a KTM 3011-4, and it has four megabytes on board, and we've added two four megabyte SIMs that you see here to give the board 12 megabytes. Here we have an IBM LAN adapter slash A, which was a popular network card for PS2 systems. This network card also has a boot ROM, so you can do network boot via RPL with this system. Let's talk about configuring this system. Since it is microchannel, we have to use a reference disk. And additionally, 
for any add-on boards that did not come with the original IBM configuration, we have to add the reference files to the reference disk or use a separate floppy to reference them during configuration time. So let's have a look at the configuration. We won't change it, but we will view it. First, you can see we have 16 megabytes of memory installed, four megabytes on the motherboard, and we can see other items such as the serial port and math coprocessor. In slot one, we have an MCIDE or an MCCF card installed, and you can see all of its settings are set here. Slot two has that Kingston card with 12 megabytes, slot three, the network card, and slot four is the ESDI hard drive. Let's go through system boot, and I'm going to speed it up quite a bit, especially during this memory test. We can see the 16 megabytes count up, then we see the LAN adapter A initialize and the MCCF card, which uses XTIDE BIOS. From there, we can boot and we'll boot into MS-DOS and we'll choose my standard Windows networking configuration. And there we go. The next thing I wanted to talk about is a configuration quirk of this Kingston 486 Now upgrade that you see here. So actually, I still have the 386 processor that was in this system and I will be keeping it indefinitely. Now, why would that be? Well, as it ends up, there's actually a quirk with this particular PS2 Model 70 motherboard. If the battery goes completely dead, you actually have to reinstall the 386 processor and rerun setup. Otherwise, the system will give you a 201 on startup and won't boot. <laughs> That's why when you saw me set the cage off to the side earlier and leave the battery connected, that's exactly why I did that, because otherwise I would have to go through this tedious procedure to get the system to work again. So another interesting note, earlier I mentioned that I have four megabytes of memory installed on the motherboard via SIMS, and that I have another 12 megabytes installed via an option card. As it ends up, the system boards can only take six megabytes or eight megabytes in some cases, and the only way to expand it beyond that is to use an expansion card like we've done. However, even with that expansion card, the maximum memory that we can have in the system is 16 megabytes. Let's talk about the network. So on startup, you can see I have a few different options. One for Windows networking, as well as an option for DOS, LAN manager, and packet driver, and packet driver only. As it ends up, the IBM LAN adapter A actually does not have a packet driver for it. However, if we use Protocol Manager from MS LAN Manager and the Disk Packet Shim Driver, we can actually create a packet driver. And in the screens you see here, that's exactly what I've done. By having a packet driver, we can use programs like MTCP and MicroWeb. Here you see me navigating to FrogFind via MicroWeb. And we can do a quick search for, I don't know, IBM PS2, and we'll see what we get back. Lots of results. Very cool, we're browsing the web. Now, I know this is a DOS Ember video, but I've also configured Windows 3.11 for network access. We can go in and browse via Netscape Navigator, and I thought that 2.02 was a good version for this slower 486 system. I'll let this page load in real time over the network. I don't think the limitation is the network. You can see the graphics are not great because we only have 16 colors as well, but it is what it is, and there it is. We can also share files over the network with this particular configuration, which is cool. Here I have mapped to my Raspberry Pi. If we go into network setup, we can see our setup in Windows for Workgroups 3.11, and we have the IBM LAN adapter A, TCP IP, IPX, SPX, and NetBuoy. So now let's get to the impetus of this video, which is to add sound. So you might say, Chris, just get a sound card and add it in. Then your problem is solved. What's the big deal? Well, as you can see, all of my slots are full and I kind of like the options that I have configured in the slots. And of course, there are many great options out there for sound cards. I know the Tech Select alone has two cards, the ReSound and the ReSound 2 OPL3. Now what I could do is take the LAN adapter A out and just use a Zircom pocket adapter like you see here and I've actually done that on the past on this machine. However, rather than buy something new or take a network card out, I actually have an OPL to LPT on hand, 
and I thought we could use that and see what sort of sound options we get with it. Here you can see where it would connect to the parallel port, and you can also see that it has a volume control knob. There's also a spot for audio in, as well as power in on the right. So let's go ahead and connect in audio and power, and we'll see that little LED light up. There we go. And here we are all connected into the system. It is worth noting there is a later OPL3 LPT, but once again, this is what we have on hand, so this is what we're going to use. And actually, the reason I have it is because it was given to me as a gift. So a big shout out to the Obsolete Geek, who gave me this, I think, years ago at this point. There is a utility that was built for the card for testing. We'll go ahead and fire that up so that we can prove that the card is working properly. So before we play some games, we actually have to remap the port for this OPL to LPT. And this little utility does just that. So first, we'll fire up Wolfenstein 3D. I'll do a terrible job playing through a few seconds of that so that you can have a listen to the OPL2 LPT. Next, let's have a look at Commander Keen in Goodbye Galaxy, and this actually sounds really good. Have a listen. <laughs> And for the final DOS game that we're going to check out, we'll do a little playthrough of Lemmings. Now the one thing that I didn't showcase today is that some games won't play even with that driver loaded. You actually have to physically patch the binaries for those particular games. However, there is a utility to do that, and there is a huge list of supported games for the OPL to LPT. So if desired, you could patch any of these games for compatibility. The next thing I wanted to try was to see if I could get this card working in Windows 3.11. And as it ends up, there is a driver that has been written. And depending upon which parallel port address your parallel port is at, you grab one of the three pre-built binaries. It just so happens that this quirky PS2 has LPT1 at hex address 3BC, so we'll grab that one. So going into control panel and going into drivers, we will see that we have the AdLib driver set. And I just copied over this specially built driver on top of it and it shows AdLib, and we are good to go. We'll go ahead and play Canyon MIDI, 
Though despite setting the MIDI mapper settings, something sounds a little bit off, so we won't play too much of it, but anyway, have a listen. In any event, I hope you've enjoyed the tour of this PS2 model 70 386 upgraded to a 486 processor. I really like this machine and I've had a ton of fun with it. While not exactly a December topic, I've actually installed several OS's on this system. And I will say that that MC IDE CF card does make things a little bit challenging in that regard, since microchannel systems did not always support IDE. But with some fun and workarounds, I got many operating systems working on this system. Anyway, wishing you and yours a very happy December, and I look forward to seeing you soon. As always, thanks for watching. Bye for now.